tourism must invest in peace, U.S. President Bush told Pata. The global travel and tourism industry is waiting to see what happens next in the Middle East. After ignoring the rising geopolitical tension for months, the industry was jolted out of its comfort zone by a sharp escalation that threatened to bring the entire house again crashing down. Climate change and AI have faded from the radar screens. As the threat is set to loom for years ahead, how should travel and tourism navigate the geopolitical storms and start charting a course toward true sustainability, especially SDG No. 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions? At this inflection point in global history, learning the lessons of history would be a good start. Since the 1970s, travel and tourism fortunes have ebbed and flowed in direct relation to geopolitical developments. Yet, the industry has done little or nothing to elevate that relationship's value and consciousness level as a force for peacebuilding. Instead, it has concentrated disproportionately on the numbers game. P4 profit is not one of the five P.S. of sustainable development, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. Yet, the missing P has been prioritized more than the others. Exactly 30 years ago this week, on April 18, 1994, the Pacific Asia Travel Association, PATA, annual conference in Korea kicked off with a keynote speech from the late President George W. Bush Sr., in which he pleaded for travel and tourism to invest in peace. Realizing its historical value, I carefully preserved the PATA conference daily featuring that headline. Screenshot A deeper look at my unmatched historical archives will show that in 1994, PATA had 16,000 chapter members, 2,000 industry and associate members, and 87 national, provincial, and city governments. It was the world's preeminent travel grouping, well ahead of both the World Travel and Tourism Council, which had only just been founded in 1990, and what was formerly known as the UN World Tourism Organization, then undergoing a heavy-duty revamp under the late Secretary General Antonio Enriquez Savignac. In his speech, Mr. Bush described an operating environment not much different from today's. He mentioned an increasingly unpredictable world peppered by strange, tough leaders. He talked about the evolving world order after the 1989 fall of the Berlin Wall, the rise of China, the tensions in the Korean Peninsula, and, of course, the Middle East situation in the aftermath of Operation Desert Storm, a military campaign against Iraq over which he presided. In the midst of all this, his message to Pata was clear. Pata must use its status and clout to act as an agent of peace. He added, I view Pata as a peace organization. I encourage you to stay at the forefront, fighting for change that will benefit the organization and bring peace worldwide. It was the first time a leader of that stature had flagged that linkage at a global travel conference. Regrettably, like numerous other Pata keynote speeches, those words fell by the wayside. In fact, in 1994, a powerful peace and tourism nexus was emerging in Israel-Palestine. In 1991, Mr. Bush lost the U.S. presidential election. His successor, as of January 1992, the charismatic young Bill Clinton, was trying hard to forge a broader peace deal between the late Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat under what was then known as the Oslo Accords. Both geopolitical events of that era impacted travel and tourism, for better and for worse. Operation Desert Storm stalled travel and tourism flows for several months. Conversely, the Israel-Palestine peace talks saw a boom in tourism to the Holy Land. That ended along with the peace process following Gen Rabin's November 1995 assassination by a Jewish fanatic terrorist. Historically, multiple events exemplify geopolitics and tourism's positive-slash-negative linkage. On the negative side, Tourism has been hit by the 1990-91 Iraq War, the September 2001 attacks, the 2003 Second Iraq War, the Rabin assassination, conflicts in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, domestic revolutions and upheavals in other countries such as Nepal, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines and many more. The India-Pakistan conflict has dragged down the entire South Asian region for decades. On the positive side, Travel and tourism has benefited from the end of the Indochina Wars in 1979 and the fall of the Berlin Wall ten years later in 1989. 
Countries such as Ireland, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Rwanda also offer ample proof of how tourism leads the nation-building process when peace replaces conflict. Today, the two major raging conflicts are Ukraine-Russia and Israel-Palestine. Both are impacting travel and tourism. But the industry of peace does not really care as long as they remain localized and the post-COVID numbers continue bouncing back. Never mind how many lives are lost how much suffering they cause, or how much money is squandered. Only when the situation threatens to become globalized and disrupt travel flows does anyone begin to pay attention. In other words, the industry sees no value in promoting, sustaining, and nourishing the benefits of peace and harmony as a permanent contributor to human stability, security, and safety. It only wakes up when corporate bottom lines and the visitor arrivals count are threatened. Why? Why do travel and tourism leaders, decision makers, strategic planners, and policy planners fail to recognize and respect the value of the peace tourism relationship? Could it be because academia has never taught it as a subject and promised it as a deliverable by politicians? Reflected in the stock prices or the quarterly profit and loss reports? Discussed in corporate boardrooms? Cited in speeches by NTO and airline executives? Why does bean counting take priority over building peace and harmony, the root of sustainability? This obsession with delivering numerical, financial, and statistical results was a major reason why over-tourism become the source of much consternation. Somewhat too late, the industry woke up to the damaging effects of unbridled growth, congestion, and overdevelopment. But at least it did wake up. That is yet to happen for the cause of building peace through tourism. Iturbonews.com Looking back, Mr. Bush's lofty speech about investing in peace and plea for Pata to stay in the forefront, fighting for change that will benefit the organization and peace throughout the world was a waste of time and money. Sure, it gave Pata some honor and prestige, and elevated the status of the annual conference. But that was it. So, as Pata gets set for yet another annual conference in May 2024 and the election of a new team of office bearers, it may be a good idea to compare the diminished and devalued status of the association itself, as well as the quality of content and attendance of the annual summit, to the 1994 event. Then do the same for the global scenario and ask whether travel and tourism can afford to keep its head stuck in the sand about the highly unstable, volatile, and unpredictable operating environment. The Middle East crisis is set to be biggest threat to peace for at least another generation. To claim to have the interests of the Gen Z at heart while ignoring this broader threat to its future is a contradiction in terms. Climate change and AI pale by comparison. It is now the overarching responsibility of this current generation to learn the lessons of history and create platforms for serious discussion and debate about investing in peace. At the height of the COVID-19 catastrophe, the buzzwords were building back better, creating a new normal and converting a crisis into an opportunity. It is time to walk the talk. Or else the post-COVID resilience and recovery euphoria is likely to prove highly illusory.